you didn't know who Travis Pastrana was, that's the kid you shoved in the locker. Like, hey, look at the door. Let's go beat him up. My name's Travis Pastrana, and I calculate risk for a living. Trick of the end. What I do? I think you're going for the seat grab back foot. Did I, did I get it pretty good? Looked pretty good until the landing. I, you know, the, the dismount wasn't quite so good, but you did good in the air. But no, I, um, I didn't really think. I think before I went out, I didn't think I was going to be able to uh, get a good grab. I, I'm not sure if I was. I, I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm fine, but um, everyone out there, I'm, I'm doing good. I just, I, sorry, I'm not very much help right now. All right, guys. <laughs> he doesn't remember his run. It's a good thing he got all this stuff on film about his life, because I'm sure a lot of it he doesn't remember. That's for sure. <laughs> analyst winds up ass over tea kettle on a cactus peel. Eh, I never said I was any good, but I did come up with this mathematical theory a while back and, well, it hadn't killed me yet. I break down everything into categories where each is worth up to 100 points. So the equation is this. Fun plus or minus money plus reward minus risk. Fun in this situation, an obvious 100. Reward I define by what game, and this jump gets me 80 simply because it's a great pickup line. Ow. Risk is a rather more complex equation. The worst scenario is divided by the percent chance of failure towards success. In this case, death, an obvious negative 100. And this is where the plan went south. The goggle camera is a fisheye lens, so objects are <laughs> closer than they appear. I gave a final glance over my shoulder just to make sure I wasn't in pummeling position. And yep, I was thinking that same four-letter word. Oops. That dude, that's some messed up right there. You know what I'm saying? Not to be the complete moron, but as bad as it went, it couldn't have gone any better yeah. for that situation. <laughs> when, it, when it decided to go bad, it went well, as far as bad goes. 199 lives. I think we're wrapping it up. Just use a couple. At the young age of 23, Travis Pastrana has established himself as one of the greatest action sports athletes of all time and the evil Knievel of a new generation. How did he become who he is? This is his story. To understand Travis and who he is and the kind of person he is, 
you have to understand who his family is, and mainly the Pastrana side of his family, because they are nuts. My dad's an ex-Marine. He still thinks he's in the military. He's got a big heart. Not many people see it. When I did marry, I was the one saying, no kids yet, no kids yet, no kids yet. And that yet would have gone probably forever had it been allowed to. And then Debbie approached me one day with tears in her eyes and said, I'm pregnant. And expecting a, a, a big ration of crap, I guess. And, and all she got was, was a big smile, and I was instantly excited. I haven't stopped smiling since. Travis has just been, uh, without a doubt, the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. And not because Travis is that kid you see on TV, but because Travis is that same kid who I've, I've watched grow as an infant, as a toddler, as just this, this wonderful little kid that just can't give you enough. He's so focused on, on making everyone around him happy. And, and in doing something, just, just make parenthood just, uh, just something that I'm so glad I didn't miss. The relationship with Robert and Travis, I think, is um, Robert is a, was a great dad when Travis was really young. You know, with Travis watching Robert be a wild man, you know, I've been there, I've seen Robert do some crazy stuff, and that's like a hero, you know. I know how much I look up to my dad, and he wasn't near as crazy as Robert. Robert, take one for your score! You know, it's really funny as a kid, you know, everyone thinks their, their father's the craziest or their father's the toughest or... My dad really is. <laughs> well, <laughs> after I met Robert, a lot of things about Travis made sense. <laughs> Robert, yeah, he can be gruff. Come on, Travis, get it off! He is so tender. I mean, every morning he'll bring me a donut. <laughs> you can't believe how he is with me. You think I'm sweet? I think anybody's ever said to me. Damn, a backwards you flip. Not. I'm serious, a nine. Yeah. I'll give him a nine on that. <laughs> My dad will not back down from something that he says he's going to do, even if once he gets there, he knows it's not going to go well at all. If something is, is doable, do it. Why not? Do it. The consequences be damned, just go. It's got to be worth it. <laughs> oh my god, Ponder! <laughs> trying to kill me. Damn. You don't Beautiful. This ESPN Films presentation of 199 Lives is brought to you by Sprint, the Simply Everything Plan, only on the Now Network. What matters to him is what his dad and his uncle think and perceive him to be, and if he's a wimp, that just isn't going to fly. You know, he's crazy. Oh, well, that's how the family's crazy. Robert's dad was a, a Golden Glove boxer. He was raised with, he, there's six boys in the family, and they're all athletic, and they were all tough man guys, you know. And so I think that um, Travis has seen that, and, and a lot of that is good. Definitely my, my whole dad's side of the family is just amazingly competitive. <laughs> Oh, good try. That's it. Oh. You know, right now they, they all work construction and you know, all my uncles, a couple of my cousins and you know, they make forty five thousand a year. 
They're the happiest family I've ever seen in your life, man. He cracks a wicked smile at his foot to the floor. Flying down country road, he's been down before. One of just three men that the sheriff cannot catch. And he's traveling 90 miles an hour down the Bolton stretch. They come in for grandmas for lunch every single day. Um, you know, they're the closest family I've ever seen. And, uh, you know, they get off work at 3 and they go pick their kids up from school and you know, go hang out with their kids. It's close, and that's, I think, you know, out of anything, that's what my, my family taught me. Uh, family's kind of the, the, the most important thing if you're having fun and you love what you do, and, you know, that's, that's what's important. It's not money, it's not fame. I would describe Travis as a hyper kid. He's just ready to go, do the next thing. What's up? Let's go, let's go. Growing up, we would let him make his own mistakes at an early age. Never pushed, never forced, but encouraged me to do stuff that, you know, was, was outside the, the normal parameters of, of any sane uh, parental figure. Oh, wrong wall! Yay! <laughs> Travis is a hyper kid. Travis, what happened to that wall? Who did? Was that a good job or a bad job? <laughs> Travis has a real strong, a real strong sense of who he is, and I think that's because we let him make mistakes. We let him fall, but we were always there to support him to pick him up. Travis grew up here, right next to him, so I saw Travis every single day. I am really, really close to Travis, so therefore, nobody can say anything about Travis in this house. This whole street's just a, a big private road full of family, and, and when Travis grew up here, his mom was in the uh, airlines, the flight attendant, and I was running the business, so we weren't home a whole lot, but uh, my mom was always next door. She did a lot, of, a lot of input on Travis. She raised him. You know, I was deciding all of his young life. Robert and Travis, the relationship has, has um, spun into from father-son when he needed it to um, more of a, a friendship. He calls on Robert all the time. Dad, help me. What, what can I do about this? You know, what should I do? So and he'll advise him. A, a good dad. I, I see him as just the best relationship. When he was in the race, he just had to jump. A Christmas present, 1987, would have a profound effect on the Pastrana family and change the course of motorcycle history. Travis had his first cycle Christmas gift right there in the front yard. I can't ride that thing. Rainy Christmas morning, up and down this gravel road all day long. Travis riding, I'm running. It's all right to live, and it's all right to die. Travis was an only child and the focus of his entire family. He went from the driveway to the racetrack, where his talent soon became obvious. And then as things started progressing, we started getting uh, second mortgages on the home, and third mortgages, and fourth mortgages, and after a while, it was mortgaged all the way completely out. Motorhome payments were in, and uh, it just kept escalating. When money got tight, uh, my brothers and all, and, and the entire family, they just said, you know, just spend the money, spend the company money, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll just sit back here and, and wait and hope things work. So it's it's uh. Everybody always put a lot towards Travis. We, we walked the tracks with Loretta Lenz when he's, you know, 10, 11, 12. I mean, just holding hands and, and, and best friends. He saw the sacrifices his mom and dad and uncles and aunts made. This whole family backed his racing effort. He took it upon himself to never let anybody down, ever. He didn't care that I couldn't win. He never cared. If I was 10th, if I was 20th, it didn't matter. Don't quit. When he was just on 60s, 80s, you know, he was a phenom. He was the best kid on the East Coast. He was the one that everybody had their eyes on, and he just knew that he was going to become something great. You know, the, the few times I saw him ride, he just blows you away. He could have amazing style. 
nicest kid you'd ever see in the pits. You'd think that he should be a honor roll student. Not really a typical picture of what you'd think of a bad boy motocross rider would be, but uh, somehow that was just him, and you kind of learned that he was going to be something good and just to deal with it. Nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> he wants to go bigger. Despite the promise of championships and the millions that lie ahead in professional motocross, Travis became more and more distracted by freestyle. That would be like LeBron James joining the Harlem Globetrotters instead of the NBA. The freestyle invasion was fueled by a movie called Crusty Demons of Dirt. Snowboard guys have been doing this for years, but in motorcycles, they never have shown this rebellious, crazy, just go for it, wide open mentality. And Travis is caught in the middle of this. Like, he, he was bred to be a racer. He'd always raced, and that's all you did on motorcycles to that point. And then all of a sudden, here came this movement of freestyle motocross, and he was torn, and he hooked up with the crusty guys and digged some sheets with them. Uh, <laughs> uh, I got a permission for it. That's cool. I don't need to go to the hospital. <laughs> Are you on break? Definitely. <laughs> Suzuki's freaking out because in his contract, they don't want him doing freestyle because it's so stupid, it's so risky, it's so anti-establishment. It just shocked everyone. Pretty cool. But alive. Hey, long way. 207, huh? That's the official? 207 is the official count. Yeah. And we're going to cover it back up tomorrow. Yeah, 13 foot short of the world record. That's pretty good. Suzuki contract, and this might sum it up, they said um, no freestyle, and we would not sign the contract. And we said, he is our kid. We can tell him there is no freestyle, but you will not tell my kid there is no freestyle. When other kids Travis's age were simply trying to get through the eighth grade, Travis entered and won the World Freestyle Championship. This was the start of a winning streak that lasted from 1998 to 2003. Simply amazing. Travis was never defeated. Travis grew up strict regiment on riding. The family totally dedicated. All of a sudden, he's got people tearing at him to do something that obviously he stands out even more than he did on the racetrack. And that's a big statement. So we got used to it, and Travis always followed his heart. It was something that called to Travis and he couldn't resist. In 1999, Travis's love for freestyle nearly cost him his life. He went out his first run. All of his jumps were just spot on. They were perfect. His, his landings were perfect. Everything was perfect. And he went back out of the stadium, made a big U-turn, and came through. And uh, at the last second, he, he just chopped the throttle just a touch, and just enough to mess it up. He went from 60 miles an hour to reverse in just a split second. He just hit so hard. You figure, how can somebody survive that hit? I mean, I, I was sure, I was sure that he was dead. They did these tests on him, and the first doctor couldn't find anything wrong. And then he told Travis, you can get up now. And I, I went ballistic. They were sitting him up on this board. Now, that could have actually killed him now that we know. Travis had a pretty unique injury. The force of all the weight and mass of the upper body was driven down into the pelvis. It was a much bigger injury than anybody had realized. Kept complaining about his stomach hurting. Internal bleeding is what it was. I don't think people realized just how close he was having blood nearly half his blood volume into his belly. I mean, if it had happened quickly rather than slowly over a period of time, we wouldn't be having this discussion. You know, people always say, as long as you learn from your mistakes, uh, they were worth it. And with Havasu, the thing I learned, I don't, I don't know if it was a good thing. I learned that you can only tolerate so much pain before you pass out. 
And I figured I'd already been through the most pain that I could ever possibly go through. So there really wasn't anything to fear. Most people, if they, if they you know, if they get in an accident doing something they love, if it, if it hurts them bad enough, they're able to just walk away from it and be like, I could never do that again because, and you live in the past, in that, in that fear. And someone like Travis is, is able to take that fear, look it dead in the eye and say, I'm letting you go. I want to see what's on the other side. And that's amazing. In 1999, the X Games was about to introduce freestyle motocross to the world on a grand scale. Despite the insertion of two titanium screws, Travis wasn't going to miss it. And then he says, I want to do X Games. I said, I don't think so. <laughs> you just separated your body six months prior. You've got to be kidding me. And you know, Travis, when he gets something in his head, he's going to do it. I'm 15 years old. I like motorcycles. Yeah, I've had 18 broken bones and eight surgeries in the past four years. Travis Pastrana, first gold, first time for freestyle motorway. Everyone was talking about this, this new hot kid, and he was going to jump in the <laughs> jump in the bay. He clinched the gold, and he was excited. And Malcolm got a life jacket. He put it under his gear. They drained the gas, just enough gas to get over, and he went and he launched it. Travis really might be the biggest idiot I know. Pretty much like Laird Hamilton, but even more sped up. You know, it, it's so trippy how his mind works. And San Francisco's got a bunch of environmental issues as it is in that bay. And at the end of the day, ESPN, in my, my eyes, I think they were winking and, and laughing. I was in awe, to say the least, and that was a one of a million times where I was in shock with him, for sure. When Travis turned 16, he joined the professional motocross and supercross ranks. To the disappointment of the serious racing community, he also competed in freestyle motocross every chance he could. All he ever heard was, you have to change. Freestyle or motocross? Freestyle or motocross? I don't think Roger was even a, a fan of hiring Travis. He thought he was a, just a dumbass freestyle. And Roger clearly has this line of demarcation. Racers and freestylers, and they don't mix. And then when Travis came and stayed with Roger when he was 16, was up before Roger and was training and doing his school work. I mean, he was diligent. Roger started liking him. Even, even before he'd ever raced pro, Travis was supremely confident. And, and naturally, he had to get hurt three days before his debut pro race. Um, I dislocated my shoulder a week before on uh, Letterman. Travis Pastrana, ladies and gentlemen. Travis. Look at this. This is crazy. Uh, and then you come down and... Oh, little slick. Oops. I did it. I dislocated my shoulder. I uh, tore the rotator cuff. Still told Roger, I'm going to win. I guarantee it. So relax. And he delivered. And Roger became a big fan. motocross in general, I mean, Travis is riding on the back of giants. He's got guys that have established the sport over the last 30 years, including his old team manager at Suzuki, Roger DeCoster, five-time world champion, Bob Hanna, Ricky Johnson, Jeff Ward, Johnny O'Mara, all these different guys, David Bailey, that established this sport. So Travis comes in and wins the, the outdoor championship in 2000. He is the next future star of American motocross in 2000. I mean, Travis was the kid. One month after winning his first motocross championship, Travis was selected to represent the United States at the biggest race in the world, the Motocross the Nations. That's like the Olympics of motocross. That's where all the countries get together, and it's a big deal for you representing the United States, and you're going over there to, to win for the United States. I don't think ever in the history of that event has a 16-year-old gone and competed in this event. The media just 
rip us apart. You know, when Roger Costa picked the team for the 2000 Motocross Nations, he picked a 16-year-old, a rookie, and halfway through the season, I was still crashing out almost every event. Uh, Ryan Hughes, he was hurt all year. It didn't ride a single round, and when he did, you know, he wasn't in the top five over in Europe. You know, of course, you had Ricky Carmichael, who's basically a god on a motorcycle. He's the, the, the best thing the U.S. Has, has probably ever produced. I mean, the GOAT, the greatest of all time. But one man cannot carry an entire team. What, what are you doing? And uh, we went over there, and Ryan Hughes got a first and a third. Ricky Carmichael got a first and a second. And uh, I got a second and a third, and we absolutely dominated the motocross nation. And Travis just rose to the occasion. I would think that was his biggest moment of his motorcycle career. Typical Travis. He crashes. Everybody gets out in front of him, and he just charges through it. Eats rocks, gets roosted, and jumps over the top of Stefan Rancada. And the Coster, I think at that point, after winning the, the, the championship and and winning the Des Nations, he made, he made uh, DeCoster a fan. Want to keep warm when you're feeling... Howdy Doody meets Wally Cleaver meets... I, I don't even know what. I mean, Ronald McDonald, maybe? Have you seen the shoes that kid wears? I'm a little bit of a dork that just kind of rides a motorcycle. He shows up with dirty DC shoes, tube socks that have blood stains, shorts, and this is no bull. You got, he, I, Red Bull had to go buy him jeans in LA. He showed up in shorts, cargo shorts, and a t-shirt, and a ball cap to do, to do Jay Leno. Travis Pastrana. Yeah, I mean, Travis is not your typical rock star. He doesn't care. He's a dork. He knows he's a dork. You get to sit next to Ashley. There you go. Hi. Hi. Actually, I'm Travis. <laughs> Whenever he gets excited about something, he just can't help himself. He just has to throw that sucker up there, and and uh, you'll you'll see it popping up uh, pretty much anywhere he goes. He can't get rid of it. So I watch you try to pick up girls. People, Travis has got no game at all. Are you a single guy? Yeah, I, I'm single. Are you? Have you ever seen him before? No. 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 <laughs> so there you are. So that, that works out. I can definitely imagine being, what's going on in Travis's head when he's making out with a girl like, oh man, this is great. Super. Gosh darn it, man. I'd like to thank my sponsors on this one. I was never king of the, the cool guy bros, you know, when I was growing up, but I still thought Travis was a dork when I'd see him in the pits. I'd be like, how can this kid possibly go fast? In 2001, Travis followed up his outdoor motocross title with a 125 Supercross Championship. Pastrana trying to become the youngest rider ever to win the series. Trying to do that today in Pontiac. Attempting to defend his outdoor motocross championship in 2001, Travis's aggressive style got the best of him. You know, it was kind of him and Langston back and forth. It's the last lap. Here comes Pastrana. Shows at the wheel. He's got the inside. What a pass by Pastrana. And he knocked himself out again. Billy. Knocked himself out again in Washuga. Are taking away even more points now. Oh, no. Travis. At his neck jerk and then popped the back of his head. He is absolutely still. That's his father coming in under the roof. Racing wise, I think it was a tough year. Travis showed Roger just enough to, for Roger to understand what was in there and then frustrated the hell out of him for the next three or four years. But Roger never gave up on him. Travis's night terror. Travis maintains control when he's awake. At night, the demons come to haunt. If you wake up because some lunatic is uh, running around the house in a circle screaming, it's Travis. Um, he's been screaming and hollering asleep ever since he was maybe 11 and 12 years old. He's terrorized by his dreams. Holy, it, it's creepy. I don't know what the hell you got in that head of yours, TP, but 
<laughs> bunch of psychologists, they actually said it was uh, repressed uh, fear. He's not afraid of anything, anything during the day. But it's just so interesting that when he closes his eyes, he is haunted on a regular basis. I mean, there's times that I just run around screaming and I don't remember anything. I'd let him run around the house, but he'd get himself hurt. He doesn't know where he's falling down steps and running in the doors. The first time I saw it, it freaked me out. I didn't sleep the rest of the night. He's six foot one on top of a bedpost. I don't think the ceiling was probably right there. And he's screaming at me, like pointing at nothing. I swear I see it. I mean, there's kids burning up my fireplace. I get waking up by the, the screams. I mean, weird, 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 weird stuff. And believe it or not, he's not awake. He's definitely asleep when he's doing his thing. And I'm awake, like, I know, because, like, I can hit myself in the face and it hurts. Some people are schizo. You know, it was like two different people and, and grabbed a glass of water and went back to bed. I'm kind of going along with the theory that I'm schizophrenic, though. That, that seems to be easier because... You know, people keep trying to draw lines between why is this happening, why is that happening. Whatever it is, it's, it's a strong force that keeps him going as fast as he does. Even Travis has to deal with fear. It's just your turn. Suck it up. Uh, maybe it's just nightmares of Robert yelling at him all the time. I don't know. There's definitely something heavy going on there psychologically. Hmm. He smiles all day. He runs to the devils all night. That's a pretty good deal. Take home the best. Ooh, the bonehead that brought blue gear. I've always said, superstitious on blue gear. They paint my bike blue. They get me in blue gear, and they're like, okay, now go jump off a 2,000-foot canyon. Great. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. So about to make my first jump now, and uh, need blue gear. As Travis's thirst for adrenaline grew, he started searching for bigger and dumber stunts. We go down to the Grand Canyon to do this thing, and this stunt into the canyon, and, and it was kind of a moment for for his family. We brought his mom and dad out there. I, I'm real good with it. It's just that he wants that backflip on the first jump. It was kind of like they were letting him go at that point. He just barely turned 18, and he needed to kind of sprout some wings and be his own person, and he's got to be accountable for stupid decisions and mistakes. The helicopter was rapidly approaching, and when I should have been saying, okay, Travis, get ready to go, I said, Travis, you can turn this thing off right now, and I'll feel just fine about this whole week. I said, this is not a problem with me. You don't have to do this. Said, Dad, are you kidding? This is a chance of a lifetime. And by then, we're running out of time. I said, go get out of here. See you later. It was almost like when Robert sends him off the cliff, that, you know, he's, he's kind of letting go of him a little bit. And uh, that, was a, that was a big moment for him. It was a tough moment. Travis's first jump was far from even close to good. He was plummeting backwards to the bottom of the canyon. Holy <laughs> that is the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> Travis taking off a ramp, and all you see is 2,000 feet of really drop. The backflip, nobody done the backflip back then. He wanted to do the backflip on the first jump, and uh, we were trying to talk him out of that, just do something safe. And I felt so bad because he tried something safe, and uh, he... he almost lost it on the uh, on the safe jump and I was thinking I should have tried it back for the first time. He's more like a this crazy fictional character that actually exists. As much as he was hurting himself a lot of the times the freestyle, um, the training schedule wasn't nearly as much. So he could go hit the foam pit all day long, you know, for two weeks prior to X Games and still go out and compete and not have any injuries from trying all his new tricks. Whereas with racing, in order to be in the shape he needed to be in to compete, he'd have to spend, you know, the whole season prior to, to the race season training every single day on a track. And if he messed up once or got hurt, that was, you know, two weeks to a month of training down the, down the tube, and he'd have to start all over again. He is focused, but he just tries to do too much. He, he's focused on his training. He works hard. He rides hard. Again, it comes back to him. What is his priority? It's having fun. You can get your ticket and come to the show. And he does fulfill his requirements for working hard, but 
he ties in all that other stuff. He's not lazy. He's definitely not lazy. You know, and I was always tired and always hurt. They're like, look, just sit down, buckle down, focus, you could be the best. And I spent probably eight months of my, uh, my life just focused. I got a trainer, Todd Jacobs, amazing guy. We did an abbreviated deal, and I went back and lived at his house for a month or two at a time. And got there in the evening and came down the next morning, and there's Travis sitting in the living room going, okay, here I am, I'm all year 60. We bicycled, and we ran, and we rode, and we, we did everything exactly perfect. I, I rested, I did everything, that textbook. I got slower. Supercross is, is nothing like, um, it's nothing like freestyle. Oh! You know, freestyle is all about fun. Supercross is all about work and effort. Being here, I'm not even close to the conditioning of the guys that are right now on the top for the championships. Ricky Carmichael, Chad Reed, James Stewart. Year after year after year, through injuries, through broken bones, through pins and plates and blown knees and busted shoulders. continually go and go and go and somehow manage to make it the entire season. That's something I haven't figured out yet. But I just wasn't having fun on the motorcycle. I rode to do laps. But what it taught me, riding every day and training every day exactly how I was supposed to, it taught me a pace that wasn't quite wide open. Good. You can't go hard every day. You can't go to your limit every day. You can't race your limit every day. If you ride lap after lap after lap, like Carmichael, like those machines, that every single day, it was very difficult for me to put in a higher intensity when I needed to, because that was what I was trained to do. He figured if he went as hard as he could all the time, he was due the benefit. 128, you can have the mindset that, that you can make it, and you have the, the will to just not mind if you're hurt all the time, or not you know, mind pushing yourself, and not mind you know, working so hard that you pass out, and then think it's funny as hell when you wake up in the middle of the woods by yourself, and you realize that you've actually pushed so hard with no cameras, and no people, and no finish line, and nothing, that you were passed out on the side of a mountain trail with only cows around you, in a weird sadistic kind of way, you, you feel good about yourself. My dad always said, you never know if you're going hard enough until you pass out. Go, Renner! You got 50 meters, Renner! You got less than 10 seconds! Pull, Renner! Pull, you son of a Dad also said you can always go just a little harder. I found that to be a lie. Whatever the he does, I'm doing another few steps. Travis is real ability and talent lies in, is in his ability to push himself. He's not physiologically blessed. He's rather average physically, but when he integrates his mind into it, and when he gets emo you know, emotionally invested in any challenge or any anything, he gets he gets 100 percent out of himself and I don't think I don't think very many athletes are operating at potential. He does. There's a handful of things that make Travis very special. He sees no reason why he can't win anything he's ever in. In the most horrible conditions, if I could have two flat tires and he's bleeding with a bone sticking out, the bike's good, I feel fine, I'll win. He was probably, and he would agree, in the best shape of his life, at that moment, probably the healthiest he ever been as a pro. Wow. He's supposed to be riding on super cross track, and he goes and tries to jump something that doesn't need to be jumped. And he, even if he did jump it, so what? Anaheim was six days later. Biggest race of his life coming up, and Travis and Gary Bailey, in their infinite wisdom, had built a jump that was about maybe seven feet high, and the projection was placed about 200 feet over top of Bob's wire fence up to the top of some cliff. Ricky, quit whipping out and hit it! That's a Travis. Do not do that. You can do that whenever you want when the season's over. Okay, right now, you belong to Suzuki. Do not do that jump. And every day, for five days I was working with Travis, no, do not do that jump. But when you hit the ramp, it's, it's pretty mellow. And one day I left him, I went around back, and Godfrey showed up that day, so I went around back, and they're doing their thing in there perfectly behaving and got to pretty much knew that that was a hands-off jump and Travis knew everything about that jump. I'm just worried about handlebar. And I went back and I ran the loader to build some alternate jump they could do and some little kid on the 50 pulled up and says uh, Mr. Pastrana he says uh, Travis is hurt. So he did the big jump didn't he? <laughs>
what I was living. And, it, it, and, I, and I told him that, I said, Travis, if you want to do freestyle, fine. Quit the factory stuff. Just do freestyle. I said, right now, the factory's only if you can't do this kind of stuff. And I, I wasn't as mad at Travis as I was the fact that there's an awful lot of factory guys were were really waiting on Travis to show up. We were real disappointed to get the news because we're looking forward to winning some races in the 03 season. I call it the million dollar jump because that's about how much money he lost on that jump. As time went on, you learned that that's just the way things go with Travis. And that was an, another huge setback. Actually, his knee's never been the same. He'll feel that jump the rest of his life every time he puts that leg down. But that's Travis. <laughs> it was right up to that that we were screwed. We were behind the eight ball forever after that. I think he could have won titles in the 250 class. Travis finds himself on the top steps of the biggest stage in the world, right in the mix with Supercross's best athletes. He's right there. As it turns out, we never won a race. Not one main or outdoor national. And Travis goes down. I don't believe that. He's had so many of these opportunities. But that doesn't mean he couldn't, and I think history will view Travis as one of the most talented riders to ever throw a leg over a bike. And Pastrana takes the lead again! Beginning in 2002, Travis's conquer everything approach started to backfire. Sickness, injury, crashes, and the growing conflict between racing and freestyle started to tear him apart. When everybody else was, was sleeping in between practice, Travis was out doing freestyle, and it, it just was enough time to recuperate. Welcome back, Travis Pastrana. He went down hard in the woods just a moment ago, and it looked like he was going to have to limp off the Travis track. was so hurt and so sick. People have no idea. It was right during the divorce. I think it took a toll on Travis mentally. Seeing things that were going on, I think he lost respect for people, certain people. I think he kept getting sicker. He knew things that were going on in, in his family circle that he didn't like. He had Parvo, which dogs get, Epstein Barr, Mono. He was uh, anemic. All of his blood counts were so low, and Travis went downhill. He got sicker and sicker and sicker. First race back disappointing. What kept him still trying, coming back with all those injuries and trying to race, he knew he could win. And it bothered him that he wasn't. He just gets pummeled over and over and over again, and the kid gets back up. The guy is just amazing. I, I don't, I've never been around somebody that just gets beat up and just gets back up. He just comes up swinging every time. That drive to come back from an injury is what sets you apart and what makes you one of the top competitors. He knows he can do just about anything he wants on a motorcycle. He's arguably probably the most famous motorcycle rider that ever lived. But I think his time had actually come and gone much sooner than we thought. <laughs> so this pretty much sums up my racing career. All the work's done, finish line, in sight. And then bam, I have an epiphany. See, I'm a pretty calculated person. My problem, spontaneous deviation. And like most of my epiphanies, this one almost worked. In case you don't know from personal experience, it's, let's just say, difficult to win championships with duct tape holding bones in place. There's, there's two characteristics that he has. He has no fear, <laughs> okay, which is what gives him the ability to keep on pushing the envelope. And, um, I think he has congenital insensitivity to pain. Most of us would have pain with these situations. Travis seems to, you know, shut that out of his body without drugs or medication. I, I don't think the kid takes more than, you know, like a few Advil, you know, after an operation. Uh, so, I mean, he's pretty, pretty resilient. I've taken care of him for wrist fractures, knee injuries. Um, his knee's been reconstructed several times. He's blown out the ACL on one side twice, on the other side another time. He's taken chunks out of the joint, taken loose bodies out of his elbow. You name it, he sprained it or broke it or, or, or banged it up at one point. I've lost count of how many concussions Travis has had. He's way over what anybody would consider a safe limit under any sporting conditions. Look at 
you know, Muhammad Ali. There, there are some real long-term concerns, and, and I hope and pray that Travis never has any of that stuff happen either down the road. Travis has paid a heavy price for his success. He has kept his doctors busy and given his mom many sleepless nights. You know, my mom, she, she's always supported me and uh, always given me the opportunity to do what I love, but I think I put my mom through more stress than, than any human being she ever go through, and seeing me on the sidelines hurt and in the hospital hurt more than any parent should, should ever have to endure, and, you know, through everything, she's gone, is this really what you want to do? Uh, this is your passion. You, 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 you love this. And even in the worst times, it's like, Mom, you know, I'm laying, you know, on a stretcher, you know, half unconscious, be like, I love my sport, and she goes, you know what? I just want to see you happy, and, you know, whatever, whatever that takes, you know, I'm there for you, I'll support you. I'm very fortunate to have, uh, have such a, a caring and at the same time, you know, a, a mom that will let me kind of, kind of chase my dreams. With the possibility of death on a frequent basis, it makes one wonder what Travis thinks about life and beyond. There has to be a God and um, a legion or two of angels around Travis. Robert doesn't believe in God at all. I believe that God's about as real as Daffy Duck. It's just my opinion. God is my focal point. But people know what Daffy Duck looks like, so maybe Daffy Duck is real or I don't know. Travis is somewhere in between. No, he's probably not in the middle. He's probably way on my side. I think Travis has a spiritual side to him. I think with having your father as a role model who doesn't believe at all, you kind of want to... Um, don't want to upset him. I don't think he believes in much. And then you have a mother who gets emotional and and who is a strong believer. Who knows? That could be wrong. I don't, I try to let my actions show for Travis and not saying, oh, you need to believe in this and that. People make their own decisions, so you really, you don't tell somebody what to believe or convince somebody what to believe. I think anybody with any kind of medium intelligence can, can make their own decisions. I think he will figure it out on his own. Um, I pray for him every day that he will. Travis is fighting those two worlds. One world that says uh, uh, church is real. You know, when you die, you're going to heaven. Uh, my world that says when I die, I'm going to sleep. And any son of a that wakes me up, I'm going to beat the out of him because I've deserved a nice, long, hard sleep. I think that God has a purpose for him. He's touched so many lives and in such a positive way that 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 is a God thing, and I know God has saved his life more and more. In 2003, Travis's thrill-seeking mentality was given a reality check. I'm 20 years old, and they're teaching my mom how to put a suppository in me. Matt Bigos uh, was a guy that I really didn't know, and for me, you know, we, we met that night, we went out, I made a, a huge mistake and drove way too fast. I've known Travis all my life, and through all the things he's been through, he's hurt himself, and he's never really involved anyone else in his stunts or activities that he's done. And this time he hurt someone else, and it really was one of his low points in his life. Paul knew Travis from racing growing up together about the same age, head on over to Travis's house, and kind of late, probably maybe 11, 30, 12 o'clock, I don't really remember. We weren't there real long, and he said, hey, let's, let's go for a ride. So uh, I hopped in the car, and I knew we weren't getting in the car to go 35 miles an hour speed limit. I knew that wasn't happening. Police officers estimated his speed at the impact of the tree as being 130 miles an hour. I was kind of surprised at how fast we went. Um, he's a lot better driver than I had realized. Yeah, he told me as he was coming up to the jump, a deer stepped into his lane, so he jumped and landed a little crooked and landed into the oncoming traffic lane and tried to correct to get back into his lane. And by doing so, he ended up sliding, sliding from one side of the road over to the right and then back over to the left into the embankment over there. Next thing you know, it was, you know, rolling in the car and had lost control. Hit some of the trees, ended up pretty high. We found skid marks and car parts up in the trees and hit that big last tree pretty hard and landed upside down in the middle of the road. There was blood pouring out of the passenger side window, and I didn't even bother getting out of the truck. I didn't think there was a chance that either two of them were alive. But the fire crew came up to me and asked how many were in the car, and I was like, there were two, and they are like, we only found one. And by this 
Travis starts walking out of the field right here, blood squirting out of his head, hands are mangled, bleeding all over the place, doesn't know where, where he is or what happened. Travis uh, was out of the car and uh, was telling me that it was going to be okay and he was going to get me out and get me help. And he's screaming, I can't, feel my, I can't feel my body, I can't feel my body. I remember taking my hands and hitting them on my legs and just couldn't feel anything anymore. It was like hitting the table, it was no different. And I'm trying to figure out what's going on and, you know, I'm, I got my arteries severed in my head, I got blood just pouring out everywhere and, you know, all I can think is, I do not, if I just paralyze this guy, I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I can live with myself. Yeah, we found the motor about 200 yards over there on fire. Actually, when I got the phone call from Jim, I said, uh, I'll call his mom and I called his mom up and I said, Travis is in a hospital, um, critical condition would understand, and the other kid's in another hospital. And she said, well, she said, on your way to the hospital, pick me up. And I said, I'm not going to the hospital. I said, I'm going to work tomorrow morning. I said, I need sleep. My dad and family has always supported me through everything. I mean, they didn't even come to the hospital. My dad, you know, we went straight to see Matt, made sure he was alive and okay. And You know, they came to see me to check on how I was. Um, everybody had told me that, uh, you know, Robert was, was pretty upset with Travis. I, I didn't say much to Travis. Um, he knew I was disappointed with him. Um, I came in the hospital maybe 36 hours later, and, and he looked at me, and I didn't say anything. He said, Dad, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. And it wasn't, you know, how are you, son? I'm glad you're okay. It was none of that. Yeah, my dad, not that he was holding a grudge, but he didn't, he didn't talk to me for, for a week or two. I, he said, well, you dumb s***. I hope you learned. If you ever do that again, I'm going to kill you. And I believe that's a quote. They told me to, to basically expect to never walk again. Me being in a chair was just no different than breaking my leg and having a cast on it. It was just a temporary thing to get me through until I got better. That car crash was the worst day of my life. And uh, more so because it affected somebody else's life. They told me. When Travis reached the lowest point in his life, it was his cousin, Greg Powell, who inspired him to accept the accident and move forward. Everybody else was, you know, didn't know how to react to it, didn't know how to, how to talk to me. They didn't, you know, know what to say or, or what was, you know, appropriate. To Greg, it never even happened. What, what, are, you, what are you so down about? You know, people make mistakes. It's all right, let's go. It's a problem. He's the only person that can take life most complex problems and just kind of blow them off. He just go out and wad himself up over and over and over and over again try to make a five-year-old laugh. The landing part is the hardest part. <laughs> but when you're in the air, everything's freedom. Yeah. You just feel it, huh? Shoot. Uh, his simple attitude really, uh, really it just pulled me back in from, you know, the first time and pretty much the only time in my life I've ever really been depressed. Oh, my God. Oh! He wasn't any good on a bicycle, but... Uh, I just had fun with life. Free time, I guess they say, is the, the root of all evil. So when Nitro Circus came along, that was like uh, just a, a window sitting there just waiting for Travis to jump through it, even before it was open. That is more up Travis's alley than, than anything that's come along ever. The whole Nitro Circus thing is this weird chemistry of people coming together. On the one hand, you had Travis, you know, back in Maryland at his house, filming with special Greg and, and whatever friend or person dared come by his house and get thrown in front of the camera and dared to do something. And on the other hand, on the West Coast, you, you had Greg Godfrey 
film producer who had worked with Travis that had his own kind of posse that was doing things. And the two of them came together, and it was the science experiment that kind of went bad but was fun. The result was the Nitro Circus film series, which exemplifies what what Travis is about. You know, it just is. It's a glove that just fits him. Chad, you feel good about this, though, dude? Kind of. It's a definite, awesome, tight-knit, cool, crazy, wild group of guys. Girls that obviously share a passion for motorcycles and getting hurt. I don't know what the hell we got going on, but every time we get together, it's a big show. Thousands of tons of ammunition here. Don't hang out with Travis. This is what happens. We all have a ton of fun. This is so awesome. Somebody usually draws blood. If you're going to be dumb, you got to be tough. Every time they call me, I go back and do it again if I can. When you get knocked down, you got to get back up. I ain't the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I know enough to know. If you're going to be dumb, you got to be tough. We cut probably one of the most uh, important segments of movie making ever done. Dude, Governor can drive! Probably the greatest team ever put together in the history of motorsports right here. Not, not just brag or anything. When the helmet goes on and the gloves go on, Travis is transformed into a world-class athlete. The Pastrana compound is officially shut down for the day. Jason Jones, Action News. These guys are meatheads. The Nitro Circus film series is something that kind of brought Travis out of a slump in his life where he'd just come off at the time with the car crash and being sick and trying to uh, recuperate. I think it kind of got his head in the right place and getting back into who Travis really, really is and, and what. With the state-of-the-art freestyle training facility and an open-door policy, Travis's home became a hot spot for friends and competitors to sharpen their skills. Travis taught Nate Adams and many others the art of the backflip. Nate would become Travis's kryptonite. Nobody could beat Travis. He was on a completely different playing field. And Nate Adams did it. He took him down. He took Travis down.
While Nate Adams was the first to defeat Travis in five years of competition, the loss only fueled Travis's desire to innovate. New tricks led to more freestyle championships, but eventually the lack of rivalry caused him to look elsewhere for a challenge. and he became part of the Subaru Racing family. As with every sponsor who gets involved with Travis, patience is a part of the deal. Subaru has been willing to let him be himself because when he gets in the driver's seat, he's all business. In 2006 and 2007, he won the national championship. driver Christian is a, a really good guy you have to have a certain mentality I think to sit in the car with Travis <laughs> Christian's been through a couple uh, pretty gnarly crashes like any, any co-driver but he's probably been in, through the worst one in the US history of rallying they again jump past junction left five minus over crest into right four plus they again left five minus into right four plus Huh? No. Should I uh, call management or a tow truck? Oh, she'll bop out. No, seriously. Dude, we got this. Get... Travis, that, that test ride over there in, in Europe, I guess England somewhere, and Travis came back just totally excited about it. I mean, just couldn't say enough about rally car racing, and I really didn't get it. In the beginning, a lot of the other drivers felt like Travis got a lot of support and had a lot of opportunities and advantages that uh, maybe he hadn't earned, but I think they saw pretty quickly that even in the first uh, four or five months when we finished fourth at the Rim of the World Rally that, uh, one, he had talent, and two, that, that he had a real passion for the sport and was a real, uh, a real ambassador for the sport. I think he's put the U.S. Rally on the map. It got television package now, Travis Pastrana. It's got factories coming in. He's basically just created a sport by himself. I think the first six months, people definitely took a little bit of a wait-and-see attitude, but, uh, but since then, uh, everybody's been really enthusiastic about all the attention that Travis has been able to bring to the sport. That sport's changed in one year. It went uh, into the X Games after one, one season. There's no question that X Games put uh, Rally uh, in the X Games because of Travis. You know, I tell you what, this is where I hope to go in my future, and uh, it's very important for me to, to do well out here. down by six seconds and there's one stage to go or if we're up by just a couple seconds with one stage to go travis pulls his helmet on puts his game face on and just decides to win travis has the aggression we've seen that he has the skill but we have seen him throw cars away he is prone to crashing just a bit but that is the way he lives his life on the ragged edge when you watch his eyes and he talks about rally car racing it's just like they used to be talking about supercross or motocross back when he was 16 17 so it's, it's not just something he's doing, it's something he 
love to do and something you can't wait to get back in the car and, and do again. Thank you. Thank you. Hate paint prep. Thank you. Thank you. Travis is popular because he's, he's got a really good personality and obviously his, his skills speak for themselves, but because he has such crossover capabilities, you know, doing the rally car and doing motocross and, you know, being the first to pioneer certain tricks. Innovation is, is key to your success, you know? I think you got to keep pushing yourself and no matter how far you get, even if you're number one in the rankings, you got to keep challenging yourself because someone's there to beat you on the next round and, and people will just forget about you quick. So you've got to come up with the next big, big move or you better be winning every single event. 2006 was Travis's most ambitious year at the X Games. He entered four different competitions and rumors were flying that Travis had something big up his sleeve. By that time, ESPN and everybody did a good job of hyping it up so much that I think Travis literally didn't want to do it. So many times the media had tried to pressure him into doing that double back at, at X Games. I think it had been going on since 04. And Travis is the type that just isn't going to back down from a challenge. When people like that pump him up and he thinks about something like that for that long and he doesn't want to let the fans down, I think a lot of that, you know, kind of convinced him into doing it. After he finally threw it in Spokane, he felt like, now I got it, I think I can do it. It was just the right time. When do you learn to calm down? When do you learn to not get as stressed? When do you learn to let go of Travis and get Well, you're a mom, you don't. So the day I die is the day I stop being a mom is the day that I stop worrying about my son. If you're going for your best trick, the one you're probably going to get hurt on the most, it should be left. They're your child. You let go in other ways, but for them to be hurt or for them to succeed or not succeed, you, you feel for them. You, you don't want to see your kid hurt. And you don't want them to see them fail. I'm just going to do a one-hander. It's going to be great. Being around Travis at events and stuff like that, it's like, like being caught up in this amazing world when it's a fun ride, but sometimes it's scary as hell. You love a kid like that, you care about him, you don't want to see him get hurt, but you want to see him do something crazy because it's a thrill, and somehow you think he'll be okay because he's Travis. there at X Games trying to talk him out of, of doing the backflip. I've seen that look in Travis's eyes way too many times. There is no one that's going to talk him out of it. He is going, period. They're seeing the jump a little to the left. laugh about it now but that night was pretty uh, I'm gonna aim a little left um, a little safer a little less chance of riding it out it was something that that definitely could have killed him if I go long I'm gonna die so I'm gonna try to avoid that but I have a better chance of landing it if I go long I was prepared for the worst ready to burst in tears or be happy as I could be every time before he rides or before he you know goes out and does something I get scared to death this trick, I've done once, I promised myself I'd never do it again, because even with a really soft landing and a huge, perfect step up, I've never been more scared in my entire life. Then my heart dropped, and then I saw the guys getting all the tools out from underneath the ramp, and I saw the ramp going up, and they were pushing the ramp back. 
And then I just got on my hands and knees and I just started crying. Cameron, just before his mom, Debbie Pastrana, stood up there next to you, she stopped me in the hall and she said, Jamie, I don't know what to think right now. Travis just told me, Mom, I want to do the double backflip. And if something happens, just remember, I love you and I'm just having fun. Well, that wasn't too comforting. <laughs> the problem is if you crash, you die. Um, well, not die, but you're not going to be happy about it. So, Dad, it's okay. Mom, stop crying. We're... confidence in the world with Travis and a lot of people always say you know if he's a risk taker he's a I don't see Travis as a risk taker I look at him as an innovator and a creator he wants to have the sport grow when they did backflips he probably brought everybody over to teach him how to do backflips because he wants the sport to grow he doesn't want it to die out he's a fan of his own sport Travis is very calculated and people don't realize how calculated he is he is rock paper scissors do it just do it just do it take home the best DVD you can do it Okay, whatever, however you want to play it, you're the one that knows. That's Travis. He, he literally could um, make a decision about jumping off a cliff that, you know, thousands of feet in the air based on rock, paper, scissors. And any time before he does anything, I mean, it's on paper, it's in his mind, he thinks about this for a long time. Oh, and things seem to happen or go wrong because of Travis, I was worried and besides being a mom, you're going to worry no matter what your kid does. They're probably going to hold me for an hour up there and then say, go. People were saying, we heard him say, you know, Mom, I'm sorry, thanks for supporting me, I love you, and like that. And I can't tell you how many people the next day or that next weekend, especially moms and a lot of dads, and actually some writers came up and said, boy, my mom was right with you, or I was feeling with you, or I was crying with you, or I was, you know, everything. And, and when Travis was saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, he wasn't saying sorry because he did it. His dad and I support everything he does. Um, he was sorry because he put us through that time of, of uncertainty. And, and that's what he was sorry for. We just are really close, so what, I, I understood exactly what he was talking about. Dad, I'm sorry, Mom. I'm sorry, Dad. I know my mom was crying off him. And I tell you what, I've never felt this before. So to pull the double back flip off here, I promised myself after the first time I did that I would never do it again. Here we are at X Games, X Games 12, and this is just, this is an awesome feeling. And I'm, it shouldn't have worked, and I hope I never do it again, but Evil used to like jump like some buses, and they used to air that as an event on ABC in prime time. You know, and it was to do the double backflip in the Staples Center, the house that Kobe and Shaq built. I don't think anyone will ever do it as clean as Travis. And I don't think you know if a guy does another double back, I don't think it'll have as much meaning. It won't at all. It'll be it'll be just whatever you know, another double backflip, but. To go out and say you're going to double backflip and then do it first try, like Travis did, is, is he's a hero, man. So I'm saying. In film's presentation of 199 Lives has been brought to you by Sprint, the Simply Everything Plan, only on the Now Network. If you look hard enough, you'll find these moments and these, this sketchy terrain, this real sketchy mental terrain where he's really happy there. He's comfortable there. 
And we override all of that with thoughts of self-preservation and survival, and this is too sketchy, and this is dangerous, and I, I want to go home. He, he finds this. But it isn't a death wish. The stuff that he does is calculated. Even though it seems risky and maybe no one else ever wants to try it, he knows what's involved and he knows what it takes to actually make it. Obviously, to put himself at such risk takes a certain kind of person in him. He's not afraid to get hurt, but at the same time, he doesn't want to kill himself. Does he really want to go out like that, like in a blaze of glory? Like, well, he tried this crazy thing, but, you know, his life ended doing that. That's not how he wants to go. He wants to make those things. He wants the glory of doing it and being alive to celebrate it. Like after he almost killed himself in the, in the Grand Canyon there, the next morning he was explaining how no matter what it is he does, he has to push himself beyond what he knows his limits are. He continually does that, whether it's freestyle or supermotor or rally car, whatever he goes beyond his own limits. But uh, at the Grand Canyon, uh, he cheated death big. I think a lot of people go through life, you know, maybe not running from death, but I think Travis goes through life chasing it. He is and always has been prepared to hurt himself or kill himself to have a good time. Mess up, die. Don't mess up, live. The problem is if you crash, you die. It just didn't seem likely that you could crash without dying. Nothing really rates higher than an adrenaline rush for Travis. Mom? For some reason, I don't make it to the bottom. I died happy. And he's always said, I mean, from the time he's young, he said, if I die doing what I'm doing, he says, don't worry, I'm fine. You know, I, I love what I'm doing, and if I get hurt real bad or die, so be it, it's fine. So he just had a different take on it. He, he accepts dying as it's just something that's going to happen sooner or later, and why wait? I mean, it's just it's too many fun things to skip them because you might get hurt, you might get killed. So he, he's got a, a, just a great... Uh, I consider it great, some people consider it suicidal, some people consider it fatalistic, but it's just good, clean, fun with a severe consequence, and to him it's worth it. Travis pushes and pushes and pushes the envelope, he pushes himself. He loves life and he lives for the moment, so I think he pushes himself to see how far he can actually go. He has that inward adrenaline, and he's an adrenaline junkie, and, and like I said, he doesn't do it for anybody else but himself. He's financially set, and you know, I don't know if he's mentally stable, I, I doubt that, but I think he's in a happy place right now. He's all about the right now and right here and just making the most of every second. You know, a lot of people say they want to live their life to the fullest and every day is a new day. Travis is the only person that I've ever met that does that every single day. <laughs> he's the gnarliest guy you'll ever meet in your entire life. You know, these militia guys and these guys that are all tatted out and inked up and piercings. They got nothing on Travis. I mean, when it comes down to pure balls and pure, I'm going to lay it on the line, no one will ever outdo Travis. His easygoing demeanor and all, all those things are just overshadowed the second he puts on that helmet. He turns into a freak. You would never think that that guy possessed that with inside him. I don't understand why anybody would want nine kids like my mom did, but I really understand that one kid. Travis is that one kid. He's without doubt the best thing that ever happened to me in my entire life and uh i'm sure gonna miss him when he kills himself but it's been a hell of a ride travis throughout my career i guess it's not that i could do a lot of things that others couldn't it's just that i'm dumb enough to give things a shot that most won't eccentric enough to figure out a way around some limit and carefree enough to accept failure over and over again, every single time with the naive anticipation of success. And the reason I'm still alive, and my only true gift, is the ability to analyze and react with mental clarity in truly horrible situations. Well, that plus a lot of luck. Yeah.